Welcome to this short video on the needs assessment toolbox of the pedestrian infrastructure assessment toolkit. The needs assessment toolbox includes a sidewalk gap analysis tool, a crossing gap analysis tool, and a travel shed analysis tool. The sidewalk gap analysis tool identifies sidewalk gaps at the street segment level. That's an important thing to understand about this particular tool that it identifies at a street segment level. It doesn't show the actual gaps, but rather segments along which gaps have been identified. And it does this by calculating the difference between the street segment length and the sidewalk length, comparing it to a user-defined threshold. And then if the difference is greater than the threshold, the segment is identified as containing a sidewalk gap. The crossing gap analysis tool identifies long corridors with low stress, without low stress crossings. It identifies these corridors by calculating the distance between low stress crossings, comparing that distance to a user defined threshold and then if the distance is greater than the threshold, the segment is identified as containing a crossing gap. Finally, the travel shed analysis tool calculates travel sheds around user-defined locations using Euclidean or crow flies distance, um, distance along the pedestrian network, that is sidewalks and marked crosswalks. And that is the, if you're using the, the data provided with the PIOT, that would be uh, data provided by Ecopia for the pedestrian network. And then any user provided network, uh, this might be your street network layer, for example. And now my colleague Theja is going to demonstrate each of these tools. Um, thank you, Jim. So um, as Jim mentioned, the needs assessment tool uh, toolbox has three tools. And the way you access these tools is similar to what we did for uh, uh, data management toolbox, where you know they're uh, all housed under this BMC pedestrian infrastructure assessment toolkit folder. Um, so you go in there, expand on it, and then you have these three tools here. So first one, first tool that we're going to see is the sidewalk gaps tool. And the way the sidewalk gaps tool works, as Jim described in his presentation, is that it basically looks at it uh, looks at the street segment. And in this case, I turn on the street segment layer, which is in this darker color here. Um, and uh, it, uh, I also applied a filter here to avoid any of the expressways and uh, local streets just to kind of show more of the focus on the arterials and collector streets around here. So for each of these streets, it looks on either side using a buffer distance to see how much what length of sidewalk is present. And then it compares that sidewalk length to a user defined value, which on the side here, if you notice it says 100, uh, it compares it, uh, the value to that and sees which one of those street segments meet that criteria. And if it meets that criteria, it classified it, it, it as a gap. Um, so to run this tool, uh, you would need a street centerline layer, which uh, again is one of the layers that we will provide, uh, and it'll be called functional classification. And for this demonstration, I'm using a subset of this functional classification. Uh, and the way I did that is by applying a definition query or a filter to, to this layer. Um, so if I were to, in order to apply a filter, you could right click and see properties. And then in the definition query, you could basically assign a what what type of filter you want to apply. In this case, the filter that I applied uh, uh, picks out all the streets that are not classified as local streets or uh, freeways. Um, but if you want to run it on a diff with a different filter or the entirety of the street network, that the tool still works the same with the same logic. Um, so select the street central line layer. Uh, you can use your own layer as well, as long as it has this primary key, which is basically a unique ID. Um, and in this case, uh, we already have created a P key field, which is the unique ID. But if you have your own data set, it requires a unique ID uh, that you need to create, or if it doesn't already have one. 
Um, for the buffer value type, uh, that is the distance on the, each side of these streets that it is looking to see whether there's sidewalk or not. And in this case, the default value we're using is 50 feet. And if you want to use a different value than this, uh, you can edit it in here. Uh, there's another option in which you can modify the uh, value as well, which is to say uh, select a field, which should be an attribute within your uh, street center line layer. And in this case, we don't have an attribute, but this is something that you can use uh, in cases where, it's, let's say, you want to use a larger buffer size for arterial um, and the smaller buffer size for like a minor collector. Then you would use the field, but you would need to pre calculate the field on your end beforehand for that. So let's go back to value here. Um, and then we have um, a filter for divided road. And if you have that information available in your data set, you can use it. Um, so in this case, in, the, in this data set, I'm, I, I'm not entirely sure how accurate this particular field is because this data source is from uh, MDOT and, uh, and then processed by uh, BMC uh, staff to kind of work with this tool set. Uh, but this is an optional input. You don't need to have it, but you can kind of select the divided street because divided streets only need to have a gap, uh, will be considered as having a gap if they have a gap on both sides instead of just on one side. So that's that's where the difference comes into play. Uh, for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm going to remove this filter. Um, so you would need to select the folder with scratch and standard geodatabases. This, for this, you can use the pre-populated one that will come with the tool, um, which would be uh, right here, this one, or you can use uh, the one that you might have created for your own purposes uh, with like your own data. Um, and then you would select uh, the output. You can, by default, it stores it in the default workspace for this particular project, um, but you can specify a completely different location as well if, if that is what you wish. Um, and then there's this input for sidewalks layer, and this sidewalks layer, uh, is optional. It basically is saying if you don't want to use the one that came with the pre-populated or the standardized geodatabase layer, which is the pedestrian network, then you would want to, um, you can input your own for your purposes. So uh, in this case, we're going to use the one that came with the pre-populated layer. So uh, you would uh, select that and then specify your distance threshold. So essentially what this 100 is saying is that if my sidewalk length on each side of these segments is less is greater than a hundred feet shorter uh, in, in length gap, then that will be considered as a true gap. So um, in cases, in some cases, it, you might want to adjust this based on the structure of your data. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at this particular segment here, it um, the sidewalk kind of ends over here, and this gap itself might be longer than 50, 100 feet. In this case, it's probably not, but it might be in your own custom case. So you might want to use a lower value in those cases, or in some other cases, you might want to use a higher value if you don't want that to be caught as like a, um, a gap. So once you run this, um, it runs the tool and um, it kind of gives you a little bit of this progress bar. And if you click on this view details button, it opens a pop-up window with um, this messages tab on this top here. That message tab uh, prints some messages to kind of let the user know at what stage of the process um, this particular tool is in. And in this case right now, it's saying it's copying the street center lines to the Scratch workspace, which is the Scratch geodatabase in the location that is provided. Um, and then as the tool works through, it prints more messages uh, as it needs. And uh, I will actually cancel this particular run because it takes, uh, so, uh, it, depending on the type of data set that you have and the amount of data that you're working with, uh, it can take several minutes, sometimes even longer. So um, I'm just canceling it, but we already have a pre-populated data set um, that I can show you. And right now it shows red here because we cancel it, which is what it says aborted by user. But once the tool successfully finishes, this becomes green in color. So um, I ran the tool already ahead of time with the same inputs. And if I were to turn those inputs on, 
um, I'll turn off this functional class. So um, the pedestrian network is in this uh, orange color here. And if I when I say pedestrian network, it's only sidewalks. Uh, if you were to the pedestrian network actually has layers that are uh, that includes crossings as well. But for this tool's purpose, the crossings are not being counted for sidewalk gap. So um, this is the pedestrian network, just the sidewalks. And based on this, the output here has a two, it's symbolized in a way where it says gap is present or no gap is present. So in this case, it's saying this red line here, that's a gap. But this street here on the side, that's not a gap because there's sidewalk on both sides. And the reason this saying it's a gap here is because the sidewalk is broken here. So that's the reason why this segment is identified as a gap. Um, and if you were to look at the other gaps on, on this side here along this uh, Franklin Street, the reason it says it's a gap is because one side of the street does not have sidewalks at all. So that side is basically entirely a gap. And that's the reason why it's saying that. And then I for the 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 uh, road here, which is 40, um, Route 40, that basically is also recognized as a gap because there's no sidewalk on either side. Um, and if you look at uh, some other streets here, the Sa uh, for example, Saratoga Street, that is not recognized as a gap. So it's that's why it's in light blue color here uh, because there's sidewalk on either side. Whereas um, the uh, not Schroeder Street right here, that is recognized as a gap because there's a sidewalk gap over here. So that is uh, what the sidewalk analysis does. And if you were to, uh, you can actually go and look at the um, in, uh, attribute table for the results, and that has a little bit more information and the details about what those things are are in the manual, and it's it's a little bit clear in there. So the different fields that it has are what is the sidewalk gap length, what is the sidewalk length on each side? What is the sidewalk gap length on each side? And um, whether or not, what is the type of the sidewalk gap, whether it's a gap on both sides or whether it's no gap or whether it's gap on one side. Um, so that is, all this information is in the attribute table. So you can change the symbology to suit your needs uh, to be different than this, but this is the default symbology that the tool gives. Um, so that's a uh, sidewalk gap tool. Um, and uh, before we jump into a uh, crossing gap tool, um, Jim, if you have any questions, if anything is not clear, feel free to. No, I don't think I have any questions. OK, um, that's great. Uh, let's uh, let's move to the next tool, which is the crossing gap tool. The way the crossing gap tool works is that. It takes the same street layer. Uh, or you could use your own separate layer, and um, it basically looks at longer street corridors instead of individual segments to see where there is low stress crossings between different places. So um, in in our case, because we don't have information on what is a low stress crossing and what is a high stress crossing, because um, that's out of the scope of this particular analysis, um, it, we are using traffic signals as our proxy to identify which are low stress crossings. So uh, we already have traffic signals data pulled into the data, uh, pulled into the standard geo database. Um, I can pull that in as well. Um, just to show you it's, it's a point layer. That if you pull in, so this, this is how the, it looks like. And the way the tool works is that the crossing gap tool works is that for each of the streets that are in here, it looks to see what is the gap between um, these two low stress crossings. So, which is, like I said, proxy for a low stress crossing is the traffic signals. And if that length is greater than a given distance, and that is something that the user can provide, the default that the tool uses is 1320, which is in feet. So that's a quarter of a mile. Then it's uh, identified as a gap. Uh, if it's shorter than that, then it's not identified as a gap. Um, so just like the sidewalk tool, you would select your uh, uh, street layer, and you would need to specify it, it would need to have a street name field. And in this case, it, it's called road underscore name uh, in the default dataset. If you have your own dataset, then you will need to have pick your own 
field for the street name. And for functional class, um, it in this case, we're going to use this field called functional uh, in lowercase. But if you have your own data set, pick the equal version of the that particular field in your data set. Um, you can also apply a filter to say which of the streets you would need to, um, you want to run this tool on. Uh, in this case, I'm not going to select any of the additional filters because the original input that is selected already had filters applied to it, so you won't need it. But if you want, you can use this particular filter query to kind of say uh, something along the lines of county description. You could say county is equal to, you know, um, Anne Arundel County or something like that. Um, so let's remove this. Um, and then same as before, you'll need to select the standard and uh, scratch geodatabases. This is needed because that is where the traffic signals data is shared. Um, so we select that. And you select your output layer, same as before. Um, and then this, the, uh, this value here, like I mentioned, is quarter of a mile. But if you're in an area where traffic signals are spaced further apart and you would want to increase this distance, uh, you could do that, but if you're in a very dense area with like smaller blocks and whatnot, you might want to reduce distance, but this is the default value that comes with the tool. Um, uh, then there's also a couple of other inputs uh, all the way at the end. One is low stress crossing locations. Like I said, we're using traffic signals as a low stress crossing proxy, but if you have your own analysis done and you have individual crossing locations, um, that are low stress, uh, that you know are low stress, you can input those. Um, so in the in our case, we don't have that, so we're not going to input it. Uh, if you input those, then the, you can also specify whether or not you want to include the traffic signals along with those low stress crossings, or you just want to use low stress crossings um, by themselves if you provided it. And that's what this checkbox uh, does, is whether or not to include low stress your sig traffic signals in the low stress crossings. And then we also have a, a input to provide high stress crossing locations. So this is the opposite of low stress. So basically, let's say you have, um, you instead of having information on where there are low stress crossings, maybe you might have information on where there is high stress crossings. And that might be dependent on, say, um, locations of um, with high speeds and a lot of lanes to cross. Um, if you have those information, you can input that here. And uh, the, if you provide both low stress and high stress crossing, the way the tool works is that anything within a given distance, um, I, I believe it's 40 feet, uh, but the details are in the manual. Uh, all of the process is also explained in the manual a little bit clearer. Um, you, any, dis, any low stress crossings that are within a given distance of these high stress locations, will not be considered as low stress anymore. So it essentially trumps any other low stress crossings anywhere else. And because we don't have that information in this case, um, you can leave it blank. These are all the, the last three options are all uh, as a, not a required field. And if something is a required field, it comes with a star on the side. Uh, right now you don't see any stars because we already filled them out. But an example would be if I were to uh, remove this, and leave it as blank, you see this star uh, next to the input, that's essentially the tool's way of saying it's a required input. So we'll put this value back in, and then the star disappear because you already submitted the input. Um, so when you hit run, similar to the sidewalk gap tool, it you can look at the, uh, if you press the view buttons, it opens a classification, and then it kind of starts printing these messages to let the user know at what stage is it in. So right now, the first step here is that it's basically creating these street corridors from these individual segments based on the street name and functional classification. And then after that, it um, overlays them on top of the low stress crossings and kind of does the processing. Um, this tool also usually takes um, a little, several minutes to run, so I'll cancel the particular this particular run. Um, and once we have this canceled, um, yeah, this is in red because we canceled it, but if it ran successfully, it would have been in green. Um, but I ran this already ahead of time using, um, so I'll turn off this pedestrian layer as well, using um, the crossing gap layer, uh, so using this particular exact inputs. So, um, 
if I were to turn it on. So what we have here are these, whatever is in the red is in crossing gaps. So what it's saying is that this here in the red, that's a crossing gap because it there is no low stress crossing between this signal here and this signal here. And if you measure the distance between them, it would be, uh, in this case, it is just under a quarter of a mile, so 415 meters. So, so it's just meeting the threshold that we specified ahead of time uh, in, in the tool. Um, and for these other ones that are in green here, that is um, not a crossing gap because this length is too short to be considered a gap. Same with this one, but if you were to move off to the side, this is a long crossing gap, so you'll uh, it's identified as a gap. Um, so if you were to look at the overall data set, uh, you can kind of go look, uh, pan around in your location and see where it is. And the attribute table for this is also uh, has a couple of fields that kind of give you a little bit more of a um, uh, understanding of what it means. Uh, it basically has the information on what type of functional class and what type of road name is it. And it um, basically has uh, this crossing gap equals true or false. So each uh, street corridor is classified as whether or not it's a crossing gap or whether or not it's not, and then symbolized by default using the same uh, red color is in crossing gap and green as a not a crossing gap. So that is a crossing gap tool. Um, any questions on this? Nope, no questions on this one. Okay, um, so that's the crossing gap and sidewalk gap tools. So let's move on to the third tool in this toolbox, which is the pedestrian travel shed analysis tool. So um, this tool shed, uh, with travel, tra travel shed uh, tool, actually what it does is that it calculates travel shed for three different types of networks. Um, so if I were to click this, double click it, it opens the tool layer. Um, and uh, the first input that is needed is the destination. So for, e for any travel shed, you would need to know from where is this uh, travel shed from. So in our case, I'm just going to use a layer called points testing here, which is just a testing layer that we created. Um, if I were to zoom out of this area, you can see where those points are located. So we have one, two, three, four, five points in this area. Um, but these points can be any destinations that you choose. They can be uh, schools, they can be transit stops, they can be uh, grocery stores, uh, or anything of that sort. So you would select your destinations layer, and uh, we understand that the, these points sometimes may not lie perfectly on the network itself. So the tools let you uh, specify a particular buffer for these um, uh, points layer. So but the default that we're going to use is 50 feet. If you think that this is somewhere in the middle of like a parcel or something like that, and you would need to increase that threshold, uh, that's again uh, entirely up to the user's uh, need based on the particular destination layer. Um, and then you specify the travel distance. So this is essentially how far of a travel shed are we trying to map? And in this case, it's half a mile because this value is in miles. And you would need to select your uh, folder, the, the standard geodatabase folder, uh, just like all the other tools. So we selected that one. Um, and uh, the three uh, that travel sheds that it calculates are, uh, first is Euclidean travel shed, which is basically as the crow flies. Um, so um, you can select the output for it. And this is, this kind of gives like a more or less like a theoretical Assuming there is no network constraint at all, you can walk in a straight line from the given destination. How far can you go? So it kind of gives us like a little bit more of a background uh, image to see how our network is doing compared to that. Um, and then the second one is uh, it uses a sidewalk network that is uh, the Ecobia data that's already in the standard geodatabase. Um, so these uh, are the two. And then the third one is actually an optional one. You don't need to use it, but if you do want to input your own network for it, um, you can 
input that layer. And in this case, I will input, you know, the functional classification layer. Um, and then as soon as I input that, it, it there's a little checkbox that appears. What that is asking is that, do you want to use this functional classification layer or this optional layer on its own? Or do you want to combine it with the pedestrian network layer so that you can run routing using both of those put together? Um, the default is that it's running them both together, but just for testing, we can turn it off. That way you can, this essentially what it's saying is that now run uh, the routing using only the street network and don't combine it with the pedestrian network for this third travel shed. So you would select the outputs for where you want these three travel sheds be saved. So that's what this is. And you would hit run. And just like the other tools, um, it, depending on how many points you have going on and how dense your network is, um, this tool can take a few minutes to longer if you if you happen to have uh, a lot of destinations. Um, and again, like in messages, it starts by saying what the tool is doing. So in this case, it's saying it's applying necessary buffers to the destination layers. And if you let the tool run, it'll print more and more messages. But we'll cancel this uh, because I already have, like the other tools, I already have the outputs prepared uh, with the same parameters. So um, this is uh, canceled while this is canceling. That's canceled. So now let's look at the outputs. So first I'll turn on the Euclidean buffer, which is just a simple straight line, easy buffer. Um, so that's four circ five circles that you see around here. Um, and next, if you're using just the sidewalk layer, what does it look like? And this is the sidewalk network. Using the sidewalk network, this is how you can get to. Let's turn on the sidewalk network just to kind of show you what this means. So there's no sidewalk access uh, on, there's no sidewalk network travel shed on these two points here. That's likely because if you go zoom into the point, the point is not on the network itself. It's a little bit further away. And that distance is likely greater than this 50 feet. So if we were to measure the distance from this, so we are already, so if we were to go and select feet as our units here, so we're already 70, 70 something, close to 80 feet away. So the buffer of 50 feet around this is not touching any of the sidewalks. And that's the reason why um, it's not able to access it. So in this case, if you want to find out a sidewalk uh, travel shed for this, you would need to increase the buffer to something larger. Um, but keep in mind that if you increase the buffer to something really large, it might accidentally create a connection and have uh, a travel shed, whereas in reality, there may not be a travel shed. So it's a, it's a balancing act to try and find what buffer to use. So let's go to this other location where there is actually a sidewalk buffer uh, because the point is close enough to the sidewalk network. So um, this is essentially using along the sidewalk network. It goes up and runs the uh, analysis using half a mile distance. And everything in gray here is actually um, an unmarked crosswalk. So that's not part of the network, so it's not included. So if you were to go, all the way south from here, it's the sidewalk is more or less continuous all the way. So it kind of goes down along this all the way to here. Whereas if you were to go west, uh, all of these gray ones are unmarked crosswalks, so they're not really part of the network. So in order to get there, you would have to kind of go down and around and down this way, which which creates a much longer distance. So in, by the time you get here, you're already beyond your half a mile length. Um, so that's the sidewalk uh, travel shed. And then the optional travel shed, which uses the street network that is mentioned. Um, so if I were to turn that on, this is using the street network itself. And because the street network is a little bit more continuous than the sidewalk network in this case. So I will turn off the sidewalk network and turn the street network on. Um, so using this street network, the reach is much further out than just using the sidewalk network. Um, so if I were to turn off, turn on all three, this is kind of how it, they compare um, between them. 
So you can um, uh, use any combination of, uh, you, you can use it, let's say, you don't need to have, use a street network for this optional one. You, you could have uh, potential future improvements to your pedestrian network. You can put those as your inputs as well and try and calculate the uh, travel sheds for those. So that is the travel shed analysis tool. Um, any questions? Well, just just to to clarify, the the network that you're referring to, the sidewalk network, includes crosswalks, marked crosswalks, but not unmarked crosswalks. Is that correct? Correct. And it calculates yes. the distance based on that. Yes, and and okay. the Ecopia data has all of that information within that data set, so it uses the it leverages that data structure for this. Okay, thank you.